I want to introduce us to uh, this guy by the name of Oleg Gordievsky. I'm not sure whether you've heard of him or this name before. Oleg Gordievsky is a former KGB agent. He's a secret agency, uh, worked for a secret agency in the, in the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. And Oleg Gordievsky is special in a way that he's, he was a double agent. He also worked secretly for MI6, which is the British intelligence. So he actually, you know, on paper works for KGB, but he actually works for, as a double agent, for MI6. Now, during the Cold War, he, um, he believes in, in a world that is better than the current regime that he's under, the communist regime. So he works for, as a double agent for MI6 for his belief because of a principle. And during that same time, interestingly, there's another guy by the name of Aldrich Ames. He's an American. He works for the United States secret intelligence called CIA. And most of us would, would, would be familiar with that name, CIA. So interestingly, Aldrich Ames works for CIA, but he is a double agent. He was a double agent that secretly works for KGB. He sold information to KGB. But unlike Oleg, Aldrich worked for KGB for money, not for principle. All he cares about is money. So he sold his country, sold secret information about his country and the Western world and the Allies uh, for money. And, and that was a, a, an interesting story about the, during this Cold War, about the double agents, especially Oleg Gordievsky, because many historians believe that we should thank Oleg for ending, for his, because of his contribution, for ending the Cold War. If it's not for Oleg, perhaps there was uh, a big nuclear war between the Soviet and the Western world. So, this two story, it's very interesting to me um, because of the, at the core, both of them were traitors. Both Oleg and Aldrich, they were both traitors. They betrayed their countries, both of them, but they did it for different reasons. So today, we're going to talk about this idea of betrayal, but through our passage, we can read the great betrayal of Judas. Judas is carrying. So now betrayal is a serious matter. It's a matter of life and death. And that's what we're going to look at today. The scene of betrayal, specifically the betrayal of Judas in, in our passage today. So three things we're going to look at. The first one is what is sin? Because I mentioned sin of betrayal of Judas is carried. So what is sin is the first one. The second one is how did Jesus deal with it? How did Jesus deal with it? And finally, we're going to look at why does it matter to us? Why does it matter to you? Why does it matter to me? Okay, so first thing, what, what is sin? And look at verse 21, John 13, verse 21. It says this, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So Jesus is telling his disciples, speaking to his disciples, 12 of them, one of you will betray me. And interestingly, it says here that Jesus' spirit was troubled. Why was his spirit was troubled? Because his hour has finally come. His hour for what? His hour to be crucified. He's about to die. Now, when you hear this term, his, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Some of you may, may remember that we've seen this before. It sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? Because we've seen this a couple of chapters back in John chapter 11. Do you remember when Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb? When Lazarus, his friend, has died? It says this in John 11 verse 33. When Jesus saw her, Lazarus' sister was weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, this is what happened to Jesus. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. In both occasions, we can see Jesus' spirit was troubled. Now, back in John 11, Jesus was troubled because 
His friend Lazarus is dead. Now in chapter 13, Jesus was troubled in his spirit because Jesus himself now is about to be killed. He's about to be crucified. He's about to die. He's about to be betrayed, you see. Now, the reason for both uh, for Jesus' emotions in both occasions is one thing. It's the very same thing that is seen. That's the very reason Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And because of sin, Lazarus is dead. For without sin, there will be, there will be no death. Because of sin, Lazarus is dead. Now, because of sin, Jesus is about to be betrayed and die. So Jesus was troubled in his spirit because of sin. Now, there are many ways in the, how, how the Bible explains to us or portray to us or show us or display to us the manifestation of sin. What, what is sin? The Bible gives us a lot of pictures, a lot of examples. But in this particular passage, the Bible tells us sin is betrayal of Jesus. When we betray Jesus, when Judas is carried betray Jesus, that is sin. So this is one way the Bible tell us, explain to us about sin. So what is sin? Sin is betrayal. It says, one of you will betray me. Uh, now, we know what sin is. If you've been around church for a while, you know what sin is. But oftentimes we know sin from, from the big ticket items, right? Killing, you know, we know murdering someone, that's sin, you know, we, we do not steal. We do not kill. Um, that's sin. We do not worship an idol. That is sin. That, those are perhaps some of the big ticket items for sin. But there's, when it comes to sin, there's, there's some that is quite subtle when it comes to sin. Here is quite subtle. The sin of betrayal. That sin is betrayal of Jesus. Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And that is sin. And that is why Jesus was troubled in his spirit. The word betray, or in, in, in Greek word paradidomi, means to deliver, to betray, to deliver, or, or to hand over. So in this context, in our passage, in, in, in our context today, or, or where we are right now, to betray here is to get rid of someone's power over you. To get rid of someone's power over you. So in, in Judas Iscariot context, he betrayed Jesus by getting rid of Jesus' power over him. He hand over, he delivered over power, Jesus' power over him. So when, when you betray someone, what you're doing is you exercise your own power. When you betray someone, you exercise your own power by getting rid of that person's power over you. Now, let me give you an example from, from uh, Oleg, Oleg Gordievsky, the KGB double agent. So Oleg's betrayal is he exercised his power by getting rid of the KGB power over him. So KGB has power over him, he betrayed that by giving that power over to MI6. And, and same with Aldrich Ames. His betrayal is to exercise his power by getting rid of the power of CIA over him. Now, to say to those who have control over their lives, this is betrayal, you cannot tell me what to do. That's what betrayal is. You tell someone who has power over you, you cannot have control over me. You cannot tell me what I can do or cannot do with my life. So if someone has control over you, or someone has power over you, and you tell that person, you cannot tell me, you have power over me, or you can control me, you cannot tell me what to do, that is a betrayal. And that is what Oleg, both Oleg and Aldrich, did to their respective countries. Now, think about it. We may not murder or steal, because those are the big ticket items. We, we know those are sin. And as good Christian, we, we don't want to go any, anywhere near sin. 
Yet, perhaps, we have betrayed Jesus. This is a more subtle sin, the way the passage display or, or show us what sin is. Perhaps we have betrayed Jesus when we say to him, you cannot tell me how I should live my life. Perhaps we have betrayed Jesus when we tell him, you cannot tell me who I can or cannot date in my life. Or perhaps we can, uh, we, we tell Jesus, you cannot tell me how I should spend my own hard-earned money. See, the Bible says God has power or control over our lives. And we betray Him by saying, no, you don't. You cannot tell me how I use my money. You cannot tell me how I live my life. You cannot tell me how I spend my money. So that's how perhaps in a subtle way we have betrayed Jesus. Or, or in a positive way, we say in, in our society today, in our uh, you know, age of authenticity society, it, we, we say in a positive way, we say, I can do whatever I want to do. Sounds good, sounds positive, sounds, sounds very much like what people would say today. Yet, perhaps by doing that, by living with that principle, but with that precept, we have betrayed Jesus. We have sinned against God. Now, you have betrayed Jesus when you have, you exercise your power by getting rid of Jesus' power over your life. You have betrayed Jesus when, when you don't want Him to control your life. When you want to do whatever you want to do, rather than let Jesus take control of your life. Take the steering wheel, so to speak, of your life. See, oftentimes we like to take the steering wheels like a little child. Have you seen a little child in, in a car? I, I've been there. Uh, when I was little, I cannot drive yet. You know, I'm a little child. When, when I see someone driving, I'm in a car, I say, put me on your lap. I, I, want, I want to take the steering wheel. I want to pretend that I'm driving at least. And a lot of us, when, when we're still, we, we can be childish in this way. With God, we want to take the steering wheel and say we want to take control of our own life. See, for for some of us who are Christians, perhaps we are not as blatant to say that God, stay away from my life. Jesus, stay away from my life. I want to do whatever I want to do with my life. Perhaps we are not as blatant as that. Perhaps we are a little bit more subtle, a little bit more polite. We say, Jesus, this is my life. It's yours. However, there's this one thing that I would like to take care of. I would like to take control of. Now, perhaps that's, that's most of us. They're, they, most areas of our lives, we say, Jesus, it's yours. But this one thing, this one very little thing, it's just a very little thing, whatever it is, insert whatever that little thing is in your life. You say, I will do what I see fit in my own eyes. And that is exactly what Judas did to Jesus. He betrayed Jesus by exercising power and get, by getting rid of Jesus' control, Jesus' power over his life. So how did Jesus respond? How did Jesus deal with it? So that leads us to our second point. But before we do that, let's read from John 13, verse 22 onwards. 22 to 30. The disciples look at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke, whom Jesus meant. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped, it, the, mor dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then, after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What are you going to do? Do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew what he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money back, He's, a tr he, he's the treasurer, you see. Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. The feast of Passover that they, they're, they're celebrating. 
or that he should give something to the poor, so that after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately and went out, and it was night. Now, in, in the Gospel of John, there's this uh, picture of light and darkness, day and night, all the time. And, and remember Jesus said, for a little while, you, you now believe while you're still in the light, for I am still with you, but I will not be with you always. The night will come. And this is the night. The night has come. It said, as soon as Judas went out, it was night. This is the turning point. This is crucial. So Jesus here knew all along that one of his 12 disciples, one of them by the name of Judas, will betray him. He knew that all along from the very beginning, from the time before Jesus called them, each of them to be his disciple, to follow him. But how Jesus dealt with Judas, he's, the, he's, be, he's a traitor, is interesting. And this is something that we must not miss. And this is what we're going to look at right now. Now, remember the context. They're celebrating Passover. This is Passover dinner. Jesus and his disciples, no one else. Jesus' ministry has been crowded with crowds. Remember, thousands of people have been following Jesus wherever Jesus go. Now, this is just them. This is intimate. This is close-knit family. Jesus and his 12 disciples having Passover meal together. Now, isn't dinner time is the most intimate time with when it comes to family? Right? So dinner time, intimate moment, not, not just in Jesus' time, but in many cultures and across different time, across di uh, throughout the history of mankind. When it comes to dinner, it's, it's intimate moment, dinner with family. When, when, when you have dinner with friends, when you have friends over for dinner, it's no longer just friends. You are now family. You know what happened in dinner time with friends? with family, you, you can let your guard down. You don't have to pretend, you don't have to put mask on. You can let your guard down, you can be who you are, you can be honest with family. And this is the context of, of, uh, of Jesus' conversation with his disciples. So and that's what's happening here. And, and Jesus said to his disciples and to Judas, a, f a couple of times here, Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And, and when, when the disciples said, who is it, Lord? Jesus answered, it is he whom I give this morsel of bread after I dip it. And then after that, Jesus also said to Judas directly, what you are going to do, what you must do, do now, do quickly. So in that intimate context where you can let your guard down, where you can be honest, with one another, when you, when you don't have to pretend, Jesus said to Judas, you will betray me. Uh, what you must do, do quickly. What you're about to do, do it quickly. Do you see, I hope you see this. This is the kindness of Jesus, the gentleness of our Lord Jesus Christ. To someone who is about to betray him and cause him to be crucified. And, and he said, all these words that are so kind, they are so patient, they are so gentle. Um, Jesus didn't say, Judas, just stop it. Whatever you're going to do, just stop it. You traitor. You're going you're gonna to do this and, and you're bad or, or whatever. Like, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said that with so much love and kindness. In a sense, you can sense Jesus is giving Judas... An opportunity to fast up and repent. Can you see that when Jesus said, one of you will betray me? Jesus is giving them, or Judas here, an opportunity to fast up and repent. Even when Jesus said, what you are going to do, do it quickly. Jesus is confronting Judas with kindness of Judas' sin. You must repent. But he didn't do so. He, he went out and did it anyway. So you can see how, how Jesus gave give Judas a gentle nudge to repent. He didn't say stop it. And, and in the same way, 
in, in the subtleness of our sin, though we may not murder, we, we may not, though we, we don't do the big ticket items for sin, we have this subtleness of little sin in our heart. And Jesus nudges us gently, kindly, a little bit through the scripture. As, as you meditate, as you sing even, when we sing, God give a little nudge. It's like, hey, repent, fess up, don't do it. Don't exercise your power. Let me have power over your life. Throughout our life, Jesus continually give these gentle nuts. Through the preaching of the sermon, as you listen to God's word this morning, perhaps God, God is giving us a little nudge, like repent, don't do it. Or perhaps if, you, if, if you're still living with your parents, or even if you're not, God may speak to us, give us a, a gentle nudge through the advice of our parents. Our parents tell us some wisdom that, that we must listen to. Give us just a gentle nudge. You know, a wise parents never say, don't do that, don't do this, especially to grown-up children. But they say, perhaps you should consider this. Perhaps there's a better way. So listen to this. A gentle nudge from our Lord. So Jesus is kind in dealing with the stubbornness of Judas' heart. He's stubborn and we, we know how it ends. And perhaps we are just as stubborn like Judas. So before we are too quick to, to judge Judas Iscariot and, and too quick to identify ourselves with the, with the faithful disciples of Jesus, perhaps we are more like Judas than, than the other disciples. Perhaps we, we betray Jesus in a subtle way by saying, God, there's this little thing in my heart, in my heart that I cannot let go yet. Now, my question is this. What is the one thing in your heart, in your life, that you say, Jesus, you can have everything else, but this one thing, uh, I, I still want to have control over that. What is that one thing? And, and Jesus is telling you this morning and telling me this morning, let me enter. Let me take control. Let me take charge over that thing or that person that you cannot let go. Let it go. Now, what does it, why does it matter to us then? This is our final point. Why does it matter to us? You see, for Oleg, it is a serious matter. It, for Oleg Gordievsky, if he would have been caught by the KGB, that would mean that he would have been caught, he would have been tortured perhaps, and shot dead. It's a serious matter. As we have said before, betrayal means life and death matter. It, it is serious. And the subtleness of sin it's not obvious, that's why it's subtle, um, especially the sin of betrayal is so subtle. We think that we are faithful Christian. It's so subtle that it creeps in in our heart and we, without we realizing it. See, a lot of big sins started small. A lot of big sin, big ticket item sins started a small seed in our heart. No man would go out there and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cheat on my family, on my spouse. No, no one does that. But it started from a very little seed creeping in. No one suddenly said, I'm going to grow up to be a murderer. But it started small. A sin of hate. A betrayal. And it grows. It progresses. It grows bigger and bigger. It's like a cancer cell, you see. A cancer cell is small. We may not even detect it until it grows big and, and, and wreak havoc in our life, in our body. Then we know. Then we realize then, by then, it's too late. And you see, he's so subtle that I'm reminded, during, during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there, there have been many um, so-called facts that are false, that are untrue. People, people seem to be expert in, in everything and anything. And recently I read uh, in the United States, some people say, well, you know, they, a lot of them don't wear masks anymore. They just go out like normal life because they've been vaccinated and then because there's been a belief there, there was a belief that if you've been fully vaccinated you can just do whatever you want to do uh, you cannot get COVID-19 
uh, anymore or you cannot get sick anymore. So there's this then, the government released a statement saying that even if you've been fully vaccinated, you may still get COVID-19. You may still get sick. In the sense that you will not fully immune, regardless of whether you are vaccinated, you've been fully vaccinated. That's what the government says because of this, all this news that are flying around that says you are untouchable, you are invincible. You see, just like sin, no one is completely immune to it. It can creep in. Even though you're a Christian for many years, sin can creep in into our life if we are not careful, if, if we are not sensitive to the little nudge, the gentle whisper from our Lord. Through our parents, through the preaching of the Word of God, through our singing or worship to God, if we are not paying attention to that, if we are not sensitive to it, if we are not humble enough to listen to it, it can creep in and grow and kill us. No one is completely immune. Now, it's extremely dangerous or more dangerous if you've been Christian a long time. If perhaps you've been through a Bible college, perhaps you, you read the Bible from cover to cover many times. It's more dangerous for those who, who can say, I know the Bible, I know what God says, I know uh, what it means to follow Jesus. Perhaps it's more dangerous for us. Why? Because we can say, I know everything, I'm good. And we can be like, we can become like the Pharisees in the Bible who say, who knows the Bible inside out, who knows the law inside out, who, who seems to be more religious than everyone else, yet they look down on others. And, and the Pharisees know the law, they, they try their best to obey the law. That's the Pharisees of the Bible. And they memorize the Bible even. And yet this is what Jesus say. In, in Matthew 5, verse 20. Unless, to you and me today, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, unless you are more righteous, unless you obey the scriptures more than the Pharisees and the scribes, unless you know more than them, you will not enter the kingdom of God will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That is death. That is death. That is not just physical death. That is eternal death. Jesus said, you need to be better. You need to know more than the Pharisees. You need to be better than the Pharisees. You need to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Now, if you were honest with ourselves, this is impossible. This is impossible. Now, now, so there's serious consequences here. It's a serious matter of sin. Betrayal of, of God is a serious matter. The, the interesting thing is this. Why, how then, Jesus is so relaxed, seemingly so relaxed and so cool with Judas? Jesus is not panicked. He didn't, he didn't put his authority stamp over Judas, like, stop it, Judas, or get out of here, Judas. How can Jesus be so kind and so cool with it? If he's so serious... Why wasn't Jesus just rebuke Judas outright? Well, because Jesus is kind. Because Jesus is uh, gentle with Judas. And the same he did that for you and me this morning. See, if Jesus is not kind and gentle with us, with the sin that is in our heart, we would have been killed. We would have been dead. The fact that we are breathing today with all the blessings. Think about all the blessing that is in your life right now. Even the very couch that you're sitting on, that's a blessing of God. In the, in, in the cold, freezing weather of Melbourne, if, if you have heater on, that's a blessing of God that you're not freezing right now in your living room. That's a blessing of God. The fact that you have a computer in front of you to zoom in, to, to call in in this you know, church, online church, that's God's blessing. God is telling us, gently nudging us, telling us He's kind, He's patient. Do you see that? Do you see how kind Jesus is? Because if He's not, we all will be dead. We will, we, none of us will be able to enjoy the blessings that we, at this present moment, enjoying His blessing. 
some of you may, some some people perhaps may see how Jesus deal with Judas as weak, as a weak leader. They would say, a strong leader wouldn't do that. A strong leader would, knowing what will happen, will not let that happen. Will not let Judas to betray him. The fact that it happens, some people say, because Jesus is a weak leader, because a strong leader would have nip it in the bud, so to speak. Because Jesus' kindness to Judas display uh, exactly the opposite effect, that he's actually not weak. The fact that he can be kind towards someone who is betraying him, that is strong. How many of us can forgive our enemy? How many of us can love and pray for and be kind towards those who hate us, who backstab us, who talk, who talk be bad behind our back? How many of us can do that? Not many. See, we, we can love those who love us. That's easy. But to love and be kind towards those who hate us? Now that is strong. And that is what Jesus did to Judas. He's kind to Judas, knowing that Judas will betray him. That is a strong leader. Jesus didn't have to prove that he's strong. You see, only, only weak person has to prove that he's strong. True? Now, when imagine uh, you are invited to a party. You will see, you will notice the, very, the VIP, the very important person, do not really need to show that he's important. If he's truly important, he does not need, or she does not need, to show that he's, he or she is important. People will know. Yeah, it is not it is those who are not important will try to show off, try to prove themselves. I am important. I'm here. Notice me. You see, Jesus know he's strong. Jesus is strong. He doesn't have to prove himself. He can be kind. He can be gentle towards Judas. And the this is the picture of a perfect leader, a perfect Lord and King that we have in Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is both the Lamb, the kind and gentle Lamb, Yet at the same time, he's a strong and powerful lion. No other leader can be that, both kind and strong. No other leaders in the world can be like Jesus. Can be the lion and also the lamb who is gentle. And that's our Lord. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, betrayal is a serious matter. We've seen that. It is, it can be subtle even insignificant, very insignificant, that we didn't even realize that it's there, that it's in our heart, but it will kill us, like a cancer cell will kill us one day. It may not mean much right now. Jesus, give us a gentle nudge right now. Is there one thing in your life that you're still holding on so tightly that you won't let go? Jesus, give us gentle nudge. Let it go. Don't exercise power over it. Give it up. So what did Jesus do about Judas? Apart from being kind, being gentle. See, Jesus loves his disciples just as he loved you, loved you and me today. He, he, even, though, even though Judas is going to betray him, even though we perhaps right now is betraying Jesus by exercising power, control, that only Jesus should have power and control over. Jesus is kind. Jesus loves us. How far Jesus loves us. How far Jesus loves disciples, his disciples. As far as the cross. He died on the cross for their sin, for Judas' be, Judas betrayal. So let's look at verse 31 and 32. When he, Judas, has gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Now, how can the cross equals to glory? How can... See, the cross is... For us, perhaps we don't feel... The, the impact of the cross. The cross is the worst kind of death. It's like being hanged to death or it's electric chair to kill someone, to punish someone for a or, or give someone a death sentence. 
That's the cross. How can the cross or suffering on the cross, a terrible suffering, brings glory? How can it mean glory? Now, picture this. Because we don't see glory in that way. Now, during the Tokyo Olympic, what does glory mean? Glory means winning gold for your country, not just for yourself. Winning gold for yourself is it's amazing, but perhaps it's not so glorious. But winning gold for your country, now that is glory. Perhaps not as glorious if it is easy. It is glorious because it's hard to win gold in the Olympic. You gotta work hard for many years. You, during COVID, you gotta exercise at home in isolation. Every morning you gotta wake up and run when people sleep in. You gotta exercise, you gotta be disciplined. It was hard and when you finally there, in Tokyo Olympic and you win gold and when you finally sing the national anthem with the with the gold hanging on your neck with your hands on your chest with your heads lifted up high and singing your national anthem that is glory but here Jesus said when I am on the cross when I died on the cross a terrible death that is glory how can it be how can it be see for Jesus, glory means to die on that rugged cross. To defeat sin or betrayal has sent Jesus to the cross. And to defeat that, he needs to die on that rugged cross. For Jesus, that is glory. That is glorious. Because on the cross, Jesus finally brought sin to its knees. On the cross, Jesus finally nipped it in the bud once and for all so in the sense we can see jesus can be kind to judas but jesus is strong when it comes to sin he he, he did not compromise he nip it in the bud he willing to go all the way to the cross to die for sin for your sin and my sin jesus is both kind and strong see because you and i today will stand no chance at this little subtle sin that is in our heart if it's not for Jesus' death on the cross. We will be powerless, we'll be hopeless in doing anything to it, with it. We, we can't do anything. But the fact that we can fight sin today, have power over sin in our lives, is because Jesus has overpowered sin on the cross. So on the cross, Jesus has redeemed us, purchased us. See, Judas sold Jesus for silvers. But on the cross, Jesus purchased us with his blood, with his own blood. We belong to Jesus. You and I belong to Jesus. This is why Jesus must have control over all our lives. Not some part of our lives, not most of our lives, not 99% of our life. He has redeemed us. He has purchased us with His own blood. This is why Jesus has the right for 100% control and authority of our lives. We should not limit Jesus' access. We love to, to limit Jesus' access, don't we? You know, uh, Instead of giving Jesus 100% access, we, we say to Him, you know, Come, Jesus. We, perhaps we, we're not so blatant to say, leave us alone, Jesus. But we say, come, Jesus. Come to my heart. Come to this home. But hey, don't, you can go to any rooms. You can, go to, you, can, you can have access to all of them except this one room or this one thing or this one person. You are off limit there, Jesus. But Jesus said, I purchased you with my blood. I'm not a tenant in your life, in your, in, in, in your heart. I'm not, I'm not just a tenant. I'm an owner. I have bought you. I must have full access, full authority, full control. Otherwise, if not, that is a betrayal to our Lord Jesus Christ, who's done so much for us. So we, we love to limit Jesus' access in our house, in our heart. Don't you see who Jesus is? He's both strong and kind. He's kind and gentle to us. He nudges us. But he's strong when it comes to sin. He nip it in the butt on that cross. 
so that today we can relinquish control and say, Lord Jesus, I lay down my life for you. All my life belongs to you. You have full authority over my life. Jesus hates sin enough to die in order to defeat it. But Jesus loves you enough to endure the cross for your sake and my sake. See, only Jesus can be strong and kind. Religious people, the Pharisees, they're strong. They know the Bible, they know the scriptures, they're strong. But they are not kind. They look down on those who are not as strong as they are. Strong people, if, if you don't have the gospel, you don't have Jesus in your life, you, if you're successful, you can be strong, but you cannot be kind. When you are rich, when you are successful because you work really hard, you will look down on others who don't work hard. You will say, you're lazy. You should work hard and get out of the poverty that you are in. It's because of your fault. And that's what religious people do. They are strong, but they're not kind. Now, irreligious people could be the opposite. They, they perhaps are kinder than many religious people, but they're not strong. How they are not strong? They're not strong in a way that they don't see suffering as strong. They, don't, they cannot see how can the cross suffering be seen as strong, as glorifying. They only see success as glorifying, but they don't see suffering laying down your life as being strong. They are weak because of that. Remember, the strong do not need to prove themselves that they are strong. Only the weak need to prove themselves that they are strong. So irreligious people, though they may be kinder, but they are not strong, they are weak. And on your Lord are both strong and kind. Uh, so for us, for you and me, what does it mean? We can only be like Jesus, both strong to the principle of the scripture, to not be compromised with the teaching of the Bible. We can be strong, yet at the same time, we don't look down or despise others who do not believe what we believe, who are not as strong as we are, we can be kind towards them. We can be kind towards those who don't hold the same views or the same beliefs as we are, who are not as successful as we are, who are not as smart as we are. We can be kind to them. And Jesus said this in verse 34 to 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I loved you you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. My brothers and my sisters, you and I are called to be both strong in the principles of the scriptures, in the truth of the scriptures, but kind at the same time. Do not judge, do not despise others, do not look down on others. So this morning, let us look to the cross, Jesus, both strong and kind. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word this morning. Um, through the great betrayal of Judas and also the great betrayal of our hearts. Though it may seem small right now, some of us may not even realize it, but as you Speak to us through your word this morning. You reveal this seat of sin, of betrayal. When we want to hold control of our lives, when you reveal it to us, Lord, this very moment we want to repent. We want to fess up through the, the gentle nudge of the scripture. We want to fess up and want to repent. And we thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our life. Thank you for being kind and gentle to us and yet being firm and strong at the same time. And we thank you for being the Lamb of God who is gentle, who laid down your life for us, yet at the same time you are strong as Lion of Judah that conquered death and sin on that cross for us, for me, for my sin. You have purchased my sin. You have purchased with your own blood. You have redeemed me. I'm yours. 100% take control over my life. Take control over the house of my heart. 
Lord Jesus, there's not a room, that not even a tiny room in my heart that I will not let you enter and take control and be the owner of my heart. Not just a tenant, but an owner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing.